Welcome to the Apple for the Teacher podcast, the true crime podcast that features the good apples and the bad apples within the school system. My name is Anna Thomas, a teacher and your host. So join me as I present school stories that are tragic, shocking, unbelievable and outright bizarre. Hello everyone. This is episode 12. Thank you so much for joining me today. Before we start, I'm, you know, I'm going to say that I really do appreciate everyone who listens wherever you are. It's a very strange feeling for me doing a podcast where I'm telling a story but I have no idea who the listeners are. In the classroom as a teacher, I have the kids' eyes on me and I can see their reactions and get instant feedback. But instead, here I am all alone, not knowing who is out there. So welcome to gorgeous Australia, where I'm recording from right now. I'd like to give a special shout out to a listener who gave me a lovely review with a five-star rating that absolutely blew me away when I saw it on um, Apple Podcasts. So hello to Jacob, wherever you are. This is what he said. Great new pod, great quality, great content and great concept. And Anna has such a soothing voice. Keep up the great work. Can't wait to hear more. Oh my goodness, Jacob, you have made me blush. That is just so sweet. If you have your own podcast, please let me know so I can give you a plug. So, Jacob, I dedicate today's episode to you. So let's preview the stories today. Story one is called Fort Knox. The school is known as the safest school in America. So what makes it so safe? Story two is called Lockdown. Students were left traumatised after a lockdown drill. So what happened? For today's episode, I will be departing from the usual bad apple, good apple story. The first story will be looking at a school in America and the security system they have adopted. The second story looks at how schools conduct lockdown drills. So the theme of this episode will be about school safety. As this episode discusses school shootings, it may not be suitable for everyone. In my research on stories to cover in this podcast, school shootings have come up a lot, but I really didn't want this podcast just to be about school shootings. However, you may recall I did discuss a shooting back in episode one. But rather than going into the graphic details, I focused on a teacher who saved her students and how she has bounced back from such an awful experience. In light of the school shootings that have occurred over recent times, I thought it would be interesting to look at the measures that schools have put in place to better protect themselves against shootings but it won't be discussing the pros and cons of gun control. As I'm from Australia, this is a subject I have no authority on, but rather, as a teacher myself, I am interested in the difference between Australia and America in terms of school safety. We will be visiting a school in America and looking at the security system it has installed. The school is in the city of Indianapolis, located in the state of Indiana, and is called the Southwestern High School. Back in 2015, the school upgraded its security system and became referred to as the safest school in America. So let's look at why it was given that title. Following the 2012 shooting at the Sandy Hook Elementary School, Active shooter task forces were set up in every governor's office in America to assess school security. The Southwestern High School was chosen by the Indiana Sheriff's Association to implement a first-of-its-kind security program. The superintendent of the Southwestern Consolidated Schools, Dr. Paula Maurer, said this 
was said this about the program, quote, I think that the Newtown and Sandy Hook incidents really made people understand, made us all understand this could happen to us. Now is the time to do something about it. We have some answers. We have the technology. We have ways to make our kids safer and we have to do it, end quote. The Indiana Sheriff's Association called the program the Safe School Flagship and Best Practice Solution and anticipated that it would become the new standard in school safety throughout the US. The Executive Director of the Association, Steve Luce, said this in a statement, quote, Your children deserve to be safe. You as parents deserve to have your kids come home safely to you after school. Your teachers deserve to be teachers and not bodyguards. Your communities deserve to move to a higher standard of safety in all of our educational environments. You deserve to be protected by the best practice solution. End quote. Here is a rundown of the system. Each teacher carries an emergency fob with a panic button. Once pressed, an alarm is set off school wide and a call is made to 911, which notifies law enforcement. There are cameras throughout the school with a direct feed to the sheriff's office, motion detectors every 30 feet, and smoke cannons in hallways. The police have a view of the hallways and can follow a shooter's movements, releasing the smoke to reduce visibility and disorientate the shooter. Doors in the school are bulletproof, including the door windows, and automatically lock when the system is activated. Each classroom has a tool where teachers can report if they are safe, under attack, or if they need medical attention. Each classroom also has a safety kit, which includes a tourniquet. The system is said to have the following benefits. Once an incident has started in a school, it takes an average of two to four minutes for a call to be made to 911. The new security system allows for immediate notification. On average, it takes law enforcement seven to 15 minutes to respond to a call. The system allows for measures to be taken immediately rather than waiting for help to arrive. Usually, when a threat is in progress, police have no way to locate or track the incident. The cameras installed allow this information to be received. They can get a description, know the weapon being used, and follow the shooter's movements. The system allows for efficient communication. Usually, law enforcement doesn't know whether people are safe, wounded, or under attack. Now we jump ahead to five years after the system was introduced. The Southwestern School is an anomaly and the system never became a model for other schools. So why is this so? There is little or no independent research on the topic of shootings and safety measures. A professor at the Ball State University is quoted as saying, I can tell you that there's not a single study that could tell you what's the best practice. In general, violence is not well funded in terms of research. There's no evidence on what works and what does not. Another factor is the cost. Such a security system costs between $400,000 and $600,000, which is problematic for low-income schools. Such programs need to have legislation to ensure they are community-funded so that schools don't divert their budgets into security operations. Other schools have described the system as overkill and that they don't want their school to feel like a prison. Instead, some schools focus on limiting access to buildings, employing officers to work inside schools, and only having one entrance for visitors. 
there are other schools of thought that say, what is the point of implementing an expensive security system when a shooting may only last for one or two minutes, during which time the damage has already been done? Some schools have taken measures to install bullet-resistant glass, which increases visibility to what is happening outside. Here's some other interesting information I found while researching this episode. In light of the recent spate of school shootings, more and more teachers have been prompted to create a will in the event they lose their life in a shooting. One teacher said, quote, My co-workers and I were talking about it more and my school started doing school shooting training. There were news stories about teachers dying in shootings and being heroes. I'm not sure how I would react in a moment like that, but I hope I would protect my students. It felt like I should think about what should happen to my own family if something were to happen to me. And it's not only teachers. A student in the sixth grade named Javon Davies wrote this in his wrote his own will, listing what he would leave to his best friend should something happen to him. He wanted to give his best friend his PlayStation, TV, cat and Xbox. He finished by saying, quote, I love you all. You gave me the clothes on my back and you stuck with me all the time. Love, Javon. While I was reaching for this, researching for this story, I came across an organisation called Notoriety. This organisation's aim is to call for responsible media coverage when reporting on acts of mass violence. Here's a summary of what they do. Their motto is no name, no photo, no infamy. The following is cited from the No Notoriety website. Quote, The quest for notoriety and infamy is a well-known motivating factor in rampage mass killings and violent copycat crimes. In an effort to reduce future tragedies, we challenge the media, calling for responsible media coverage for the sake of public safety. When reporting on individuals who commit or attempt acts of rampage and mass violence, thereby providing violent, like-minded individuals the media, celebrity and media spotlight they so crave. End quote. Here is what the organisation proposes for media protocol. To balance the public's need for information versus potential harm, to recognise that infamy serves as a motivating factor for copycat crimes, to report the facts of an act without adding complementary colour to the individual, to limit a perpetrator's name to once in a media piece, never in a headline and no photo, to refuse to publish any statements or manifestos of murderers, and to make the names and photos of the victims prominent. They cite countless examples on their website of how it was shown that various mass shooters were motivated by infamy or enacted copycat crimes. Some studied other shootings before conducting their own. One shooter felt he couldn't make a mark on the world but could become famous by blowing up people. Another individual had a spreadsheet of mass murderers and how many people they had killed. In another incident, the perpetrator called a local news station during his attack and then checked Facebook to see if it had gone viral. When asked questions about their goals, the organisation has responded in the following ways. One such question asks, isn't public safety at risk when there is a killer on the loose and you ask the media to limit the use of their name and photo? They responded by saying, quote, The No Notoriety Protocol clearly states that if it helps in the assailant's apprehension, the assailant should be named and photo shown. 
we are talking about eliminating the gratuitous use of the name and photo after the killer has been apprehended or found dead. End quote. Another question asks, aren't you essentially asking for media censorship? Their response is, quote, no, we have never asked for censorship. We are asking for the same consideration that has been given in other areas of reporting. The media has already set precedent by voluntarily changing their policies when reporting on victims of sexual assault, suicide and on juveniles. We're saying it's time for another policy change for the sake of public safety. End quote. This organisation was founded by Tom and Karen Teves. In 2012, their son Alex was murdered in the Aurora Theatre shooting in Colorado. They founded the organisation in the days immediately following their son's death. I wholeheartedly applaud this organisation for what they're doing. It's a very good website, so go and have a look if you're interested. So before we go on to story two, I'd like to give you a preview of another true crime podcast called Texla True Crime, which has stories from Texas and Louisiana. Here's a clip. Hey y'all, it's Lisa from Texla True Crime. I've got a brand new podcast that covers homicides, missing people, and well, anything that I want to talk about in Texas and Louisiana. I do tell some jokes and I do try to keep it kind of light, but at the end of the day, we're trying to give voices back to the people who no longer have them and to bring stories that have kind of fallen out of the limelight back into it. I hope you'll join me. You can find me on iTunes or wherever you download your podcast. Bye y'all. I hope you're hearing from me soon. Now we're going to look at how schools use lockdown drills. All schools have procedures in place in the event of a fire breaking out. Fire drills have been something as a teacher that I have participated in for as long as I can remember. However, lockdown drills are a relatively recent inclusion. I can't exactly recall, but I would guess we began doing them probably somewhere between five to ten years ago in Australia. I will give an account of what we do and then we'll describe lockdown drills in America. We have two different alarms for a fire drill and a lockdown drill. When the lockdown alarm goes off, the students lay down on the floor under their desks. Teachers lock doors, turn off lights, close windows and pull curtains or blinds down. Students are instructed not to talk and remain totally still. Then the administration contacts each classroom via the intercom and asks if all students are accounted for. Once all the classrooms have been checked, the drill is over and it probably lasts for about 15 minutes. Now let's look at what happens in America. As well as the general lockdown drill I just described, a large proportion of schools go one step further and do active shooter drills. The drills are made as realistic as possible, with gunshot sounds being simulated, the use of smoke, and even fake blood. In some cases, teachers pretend to be shooters, moving throughout the school and attempting to enter classrooms. Just in March this year, an elementary school in Indiana put their teachers through the following active shooter drill. Law enforcement officials ordered teachers to turn around and crouch down and then shot them execution style with plastic pellets. The teachers were bruised and some even drew blood. Here's an account of what happened at another school during a lockdown drill cited from the Atlantic newspaper. Quote, at 10.21 a.m. on December the 6th, Lake Brantley High School in Florida initiated a code red lockdown. This is not a drill, a voice announced over the PA system. At the same moment, 
teachers received a text message warning of an active shooter on campus. Fearful students took shelter in classrooms. Many sobbed hysterically. Others vomited or fainted, and some sent farewell notes to parents. A later announcement prompted a stampede in the cafeteria as students fled the building and jumped over fences to escape. Parents flooded 911 with frantic calls. Later, it was revealed to the fury of parents, teachers and students that in fact it was just a drill. We always tell students we're doing drills. With the case just cited being an example of how a drill can be positively terrorising when students are not informed that it's just a drill. Here is an account of what a 12-year-old student wrote during a drill that he thought was real. Quote, I am so sorry for anything I have done, the trouble I have caused. Right now I'm scared to death. I need a warm, soft hug. I hope that you are going to be okay with me gone. As a teacher, I just just I just find this heartbreaking that that kid should be put through that. It's just not just high schools that do these drills. It also occurs in younger grades. Young children practice running in zigzag patterns to dodge bullets. One school has a poster of the words of the nursery rhyme "Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star," but instead they change the words. And the children are taught to sing, lock down, lock down, lock the door, shut the lights off, say no more. In my experience as a teacher in Australia, my school has adopted the approach that a lockdown is explained to students as follows. We might say something like, there could be a dog on the loose in the school and we need to keep everyone inside until someone can catch the dog. Or there may be someone outside who is very angry and we need to stay inside until they calm down or go away. We are instructed not to use the scenario of someone with a gun. Obviously, this approach is taken in the primary school setting with younger students. And of course, other schools may take different approaches. So there may be schools in Australia which may um, decide to reference someone with a gun, but in my experience, I haven't come across this myself. The following incident occurred at a primary school in Australia. Students were told there was a bad man with a gun and also a crazy teacher. One six-year-old went home and said the following to her father. We were doing the drill in case that a bad man with a gun came into the school or if a teacher went bad in the head. It was very real and I almost wet my pants. So even though they were told it was a drill, many of the students were left traumatised. In my own personal experience, I've never known of a school to take such extreme measures during a drill. So in the Australian context... I believe that it would be a rarity. The topic of school safety will continue to be vigorously debated. So where do you stand? I would really like to hear about how schools in other countries tackle this topic. So feel free to contact me and share your experiences. So that's almost the end. I'd like to now give you a preview of episode 13. It's called We Are Family and His Father's Son. Here's a summary. It was the first day of a new school year. The three brothers did not attend. Why? Manuel went to pick up his son from school, but he wasn't there. Where was he? So to end this episode, I will leave you with this quote. A teacher's job is to take a bunch of live wires and see that they are well grounded. Bye for now and remember to be a good apple.